lifting up our voice to rejoice together. This morning we will be in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but I would like to begin by having you open in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 in the first seven verses. Before we consider 1 Timothy 3 verses 8 through 13, let me pray. Father, thank you as we have been reminded the greatness of your word, the beauty of your word, the impact of your word to us and your word for us today in every aspect of my life and our life together as a church. And I would ask that Holy Spirit, as you use me in proclaiming the truths here from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, there would be clarity, perhaps even some question. But to hear from you what the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has written and left for the church. So teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 6, we read as Luke writes here, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmaranus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith." It's interesting, and this may or may not be a familiar passage here. Some say this is perhaps the the beginnings of what we know as the diaconate or deacons. And and yet this term for deacons is never used here in this passage. They're never called deacons here. What it means, and when it's talking about them, they are there to serve. Some have even said in conversations I've had is perhaps these are perhaps first elders because the apostles were going about this work, not to show apostolic succession, but perhaps this is maybe the beginning of elders and what they did to begin when you compare that to what we do now and have now when it comes to elders and deacons. The word that's used here for a servant Paul uses 21 times. It's interesting. The the word deacon is actually a a transliteration of the word diakonos in various forms that we'll see in 1 Timothy. So I would invite you to turn there now in 1 Timothy 3. As we consider these qualifications of a deacon, a minister, a servant. Sometimes I can't help but wonder based on what we're maybe used to in our church culture to call them simply ministers or servants. Sometimes there's all kind of baggage wrapped around that word deacon, what that involves. It's interesting, when you, when you just do a word search and the times that Paul uses this word diakonos or various forms for that word, it does translate to minister or servant. And so in Romans 16.1, he says, I want to commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Chencre. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants 
through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to his task. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul talks about the gospel, which I, Paul, became a minister of. I'm, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. That's 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Colossians 1, 23. The gospel of which I, Paul, became a minister. And then in verse 25, Colossians 1, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God. So we see this interchange of the word there that we typically think of, of deacon or the office of deacon in the local church. It, it primarily has a meaning of, of purposing someone who performs some type of service or ministry, particularly within the local context of the local church. Most frequently, though, we often think of it in the terms of this office of a deacon, where we have an office of elders or overseers in an office, or sometimes we have boards of deacons and elders. We don't think of it simply in this broader context of ministers and servants. And yet what we see clearly throughout Scripture is that many are deacons. They're ministers of the gospel. They're servants of the gospel. It's interesting, even when we do just a peripheral perusal through the New Testament, how little the New Testament actually says concerning deacons. What they did specifically. Here we have the qualifications for those who, who would be in this position of minister or servant. But as far as the details of kind of this, this office, and I had a wonderful discussion with the dear brother concerning this. Is it truly an office? The word is never used here in the text in 1 Timothy 3. Even for the elders. In verse 1, it says even in the ESV, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, but in, in the original, that word office is not there. So apparently, it seems, by this time when Paul writes at the end of his life, this establishment of this position as an overseer, elder, in this form of an office, and even of a deacon, seems to have been in place in the local churches. And, and so what we have is, this place, and, and people to serve in this capacity, and, and yet, there's so little known. And so what we do is we take what we have seen through church history. We, we take what we know from previous church experience on what deacons did and how they went about serving the church in those roles. What we do know, according to this particular text, just like with the elders, that these deacons, ministers, servants, like the elders, are to exhibit lives shaped and conformed to and by the gospel. It's interesting, and as we go through this, you'll notice this, you may already know this, the one distinction in the qualifications between the elder and the deacon is that there is no qualification for the elders to be able to teach. But yet... I do believe that quality comes into play concerning those who serve in this role. I mean, this list, just like that for the overseers, focuses more on the character of the individual rather than the simple duties that they go about doing. And so with all that in mind, would you follow along as I read verses 8 through 13 as Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and with the same authority Paul wrote to Timothy in the church at Ephesus in the first century, so he writes, and we hear, he's written, and we hear with that same authority. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word as the Holy Spirit makes right and proper application this morning.
So this morning, as we consider this text, I would like us in our big picture, big aim to walk away from this text specifically, seeing the beauty of the role of a deacon, minister, servant. And here Paul is clear in what he lays out, what qualifies this individual to be a deacon, minister, servant in the local church. Again, just like he did in the qualifications for an elder, he lays out both positive and negative qualifications here. Maybe not to a greater, as great extent there as he did with the elders, but he begins with these positive qualifications in verses 8, 9, and 10. In verse 12, listing some negative qualifications there in verse 8. And so what are they? What does that mean? He says there, to begin with, deacons likewise, ta- drawing in the togetherness of those who are deacons, ministers, servants, and those of overseers. Again, if we consider this as an office, he's tying these two together and how they serve alongside each other. Even to the point of the deacons serving the elders, in a, not in a greater or lesser comparison, but they are an extension of the elders and what they're doing in the ministry they are taking on. You know, these aren't the credentials that most people would look for on a resume. You apply for a job, I'm sure these aren't qualifications that you're going to list. Well, I'm not a drunkard. I I think I'm pretty dignified. I promise you I'm not double-tongued. I'm not addicted to much wine. You know, and yet these are characteristics of what's happening internally. And we'll, we'll come back to those, not just the negative ones. You see, Paul is reminding the church concerning these ministers, these servants, that these qualifications have to do with personal morals. How one is affected because of the gospel internally, so it affects how one lives externally. It also is a reminder that God is concerned with who the deacons are versus what they do. So he says they must be dignified here He carries this idea of being honorable, honorable in their conduct, honorable in their speech. This is almost exactly what he's referring to the elders there back in verse 2 of chapter 3 concerning the elders to be above reproach. They are admirable. They're to be commended. They are commendable. He goes on, not only are they to be dignified, they must hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience there in verse 9. And so Paul will use this phrase, the mystery of the faith, Multiple times, not simply here in 1 Timothy. It's very common, so he'll use it in sections of Romans, chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, which sometimes you'll hear me quote as a benediction. This mystery of the faith. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. And what Paul is getting at is this content of the gospel being unfolded through the ages to come to Christ. This mystery of faith refers to here the entire content of God's revealed plan pointing to Christ. And how God and the triune God has brought salvation to come and to bear upon people through Christ. This is that mystery. It is no longer a mystery. When we consider the saints in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, it was a mystery because Christ had not yet been revealed to them. But for us, in those there in the first century, Christ has indeed been revealed. It's interesting, one writer notes this. He says this, Paul's counsel to Timothy assumes here that the deacons are not just busy activists. And and he means activists in a good way, that they're not just simply busy doing things. Because, I mean, if we're honest, that's typically how we envision the servants, the ministers, the deacons of a church. They're busy doing things among the church, whether it's for a building or the grounds or or serving other people. But as counsel to Timothy assumes that the deacons are not just busy activists, but also capable and and informed in matters pertaining to Christian teaching, experience, and to some extent, the scriptures themselves. They understand what the gospel is. They can tell you what the gospel is, what it's about. And and this is where, although it's not 
specifically outlined here that they are able to teach. There is this component of teaching for deacons simply based on the nature of the work they do. That they may face an aspect, a component in their service of teaching and teaching about the gospel. They may serve, as we do here, primarily internally within the context of our local church, but there's also ministry externally, outside of the church. And so we think about this, how they must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They understand the gospel. They can explain the gospel outside of the church as they're helping someone that may be in need to share the good news of the gospel, why Christ matters and makes a difference. I would argue for the very same reason even to other Christians to encourage them of why the gospel matters so that we don't lose sight. They hold to this mystery of faith with a clear conscience. They are grounded in clear Christian orthodoxy and sound doctrine. It doesn't mean they have Grudem's systematic theology book completely memorized. It's only about that thick. Or they have a second edition memorized. Or the larger catechism. But they understand true orthodoxy, what is biblical. Because of the fact they may have to give counsel and advice, biblical advice to someone as they're serving. And then he goes on there in verse 10, and let them also be tested first. Now it's interesting, Paul brings this out with the deacons, but he doesn't bring this out with the elders. Some make an assumption of a possibility that elders were also under this time of testing. And so how this comes out sometimes in a local church is they may say, We're, we are looking to bring on a man to be an elder or, or a deacon, and, and they'll have a one-year time of watching. Now again, just the way we think sometimes, not everybody, then we think, well, this is just a trial, and then he becomes an official deacon, or if they do this for elders, an official elder. But it seems, at least at this point, at the end of Paul's life, there was a need for this, to test them, to see if they are of sound orthodox doctrine, to watch them. Sure, they would have been watching them as they're serving in the church already, as, as they're going about ministering among the body, among people in their community. But let them be tested and let them serve as servants or ministers if they prove themselves blameless. It's not perfection. There is a time of scrutiny for them. Again, I think this comes back to not only do you see them when they're gathered together, but do you see them outside the context of the local gathering, the local church? Just like in verse 6, you remember, he says the elder could not be a new believer, a novice, a young convert. So it seems even for deacons, there's some type of track record. And it's not that the elders are standing there doing their little check marks and checking the boxes, but that they are encouraging others as they serve. Now, when you think about this and, and watching them to, to test them, sometimes that testing comes before someone might even be considered to be a deacon. They're already serving in the local church. They're already serving other people. And so their life, their life has been already perceived and watched. What's interesting to note here in these positive qualifications of the deacon, of the minister, of the servant, is to, to come away from this text and see that the Bible gives so much freedom because it doesn't specify how they are to be ministered to, how they are to be examined. That's left up to the, the elders in that. Yes, they are to be scrutinized to some extent. I mean, it, Paul wouldn't have left this if it wasn't important. But how that discretion takes place is left up to the local church. Thus you see deacons perhaps already serving in various roles and capacities in the local church 
And sometimes I think here is where we just need to take heed and, and take warning to not project our past experiences in church life, primarily perhaps not good experiences, into the expectations of deacons here at Redeemer, future deacons. For that matter, future elders. But there is a time, obviously, and this is part of the qualifications. Let them be tested first. Let them serve. And if they prove themselves blameless, or they are able to serve in this capacity and all that it entails, then call them to serve. And so sometimes how we see this fleshed out in, in some churches, they have that kind of probationary period for a year, and then they serve as an, an official capacity as a deacon, as a minister, as a servant of the church. And again, you get into questions of this office and, and then what's perceived by that title, so to speak. Paul doesn't stop there. If you look down in verse 12, he says, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, just like with the elders. They are a one-woman man. They are committed to their wife. And again, he's not. Paul is not saying, just like he wasn't saying with the elders, that they must be married. But if they are, they are committed to their wife and their wife only. There is this aspect of this particular commitment. And then he goes on and continues in verse 12, very similar to what he did with the elders, although the order is switched around here, managing their children and their households well. And so there is this component of the deacon's life outside of church. Now again, think of the context here in Paul's writing. He's writing to Timothy, the church at Ephesus, and where did they meet? They met in home. So it was very easy to see the life of those who would perhaps be an elder or a deacon in this case, to see their life with their family, because their family was there, the church met in their homes. But in our day and age, that may not be so easy. The man being considered, in this case, for a deacon, a minister, a servant, may perhaps live a completely different life at home, outside of his life together. And so that's why I believe Paul, in the wisdom, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this, was to watch them. How do they manage their children? It's not saying, again, I, I think I need to re reiterate this, sometimes there's an expectation that the, 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 the elder or the deacon's children must be perfect, well-mannered. And as we all know, whether you're a parent or not, when you're around children, particularly young children, that's not always the case. But it, it is a reason and a means to take into consideration for one being considered for a deacon or an elder. How do they manage their house? He wasn't living a double life, is what Paul's getting at. So there's kind of where Paul is going concerning the one who would perhaps seek out or is being asked in uh, to serve in this capacity as a minister, as a deacon. But we can't ignore the negative qualifications there in verse 8. Just like with the elder, the negative qualifications that he brought out there. In, in verse 3, but here for the deacon in verse 8, he says he's not to be double-tongued. He doesn't say one thing and means another. He says one thing and does completely the opposite. He is not to be one who is insincere, not only by his words, but in his actions. He's not to be addicted to much wine. Just like the elder was not to be a drunkard, so the deacon is not to be addicted to much wine. So again, the scripture is very clear. The scriptures are not forbidding the elder or the deacon to drink. And for all that matter, for any Christian, that is on one's uh, conscience and the liberty they feel. That's a whole other uh, component of this that I think our Christian culture has abused, I think on both sides, but mostly on the side to say no Christian should ever drink. I think Scripture is clear when it comes to that. That's your side note. 
But the deacon is not to be addicted to this. He's not dependent upon it. He, he is not in an abusive relationship with wine, with drink, strong drink. He's not to overuse it to the point where it becomes a dependence in order to function. Because then they just simply make foolish decisions. And thus they would disqualify themselves here for the deacon or previously for the elder. And, and then finally, he says, they're not to be greedy for dishonest gain. Why would Paul say that? Now, for the elders, he said they're not to be lovers of money there in verse 3. I think Paul understands he has seen what has happened perhaps in some churches. Those who were serving in this capacity because of the very nature of what they do. Because sometimes it's the deacons who oversee the outgoing of finances for the church to help people in the church. And so they have access to those finances. And so one could be drawn to use the finances of the church for their own gain and their own purposes. As they're helping others. And, and oftentimes the help comes privately. There are times, let's face it, when we do know of needs within the church. And we know that help is being made. Some will just directly help, but sometimes help is made within the context of the deacons. And for us right now, not having deacons, it just typically comes through the elders. As the needs are known. But again, Paul says here in verse 8, they're not greedy for dishonest gain. They are trustworthy in the finances that they have been entrusted to oversee. And so typically in the church, there's accountability. So how, how that is fleshed out in order to prevent this. And, and for us, we have set a threshold of a certain amount of dollars where you might need uh, uh, multiple signatures if there's a check being issued. We don't issue cash. We will help and pay bills when, it's, when there's a need and it's known. So you put these things in place because of the temptation to be drawn to this love for money. And, and so there they are. Qualifications very similar to that of elder outside of this qualification there of being able to teach they're teaching sound doctrine, and yet there is this component we see because of the nature of their service and ministry and helping others. To help encourage someone. Reading the Psalms, explaining a Psalm or another passage. And, and, and again, to be considered for this place of service and ministry within the context of the local church. So there's the positive and negative, but there's still more. And with the time we have remaining, I want to address this. Look at verse 11. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. So, so here's a bit of a conundrum. So sort of. I like how one writer summarizes there's kind of four positions when it comes to this particular text here. One, this is talking about women who are part of the general order of deacons. Or, they're female deacons or deaconesses who correspond somehow to the male deacons. Or, they're assistants to the deacons like those praiseworthy widows of 1 Timothy 5, verses 9 and 10, and the older women who train the younger women, or four, their deacons' wives. I think in my understanding in reading this text, I lean towards the fourth one, that they are actually, Paul's referring to the deacons' wives, although I can see the means for number three. There are those women who were assisting the deacons, and, and again, we have to think about the context in which we grew up in a church, the church where we were previously coming to Redeemer. Some churches have actual deacons and deaconesses in that formal office. Put that in quotes. But it's interesting because both elder and deacon 
the qualification they are to be the husband of one wife. This is where I see that he's referring specifically to the wives of the deacons. But again, he's not saying women are unable to serve. And that's why I think it's important to understand the meaning of that word deacon. It means minister or servant. And so women are serving and ministering. And again, when we think about this, and we typically think about this concerning the office of elder and office of deacon, there is a sense of um, leadership there. And we uh, talked about some of that back from verse two, uh, or chapter 2 and 3. But when he talks about their wives specifically, he says, likewise they must be dignified, that they also are worthy of respect, just like the deacon there in verse 8. That they're not slanderers here. And the idea that Paul's getting at here with this word for slanderers is that they don't have any malicious talk or false accusations that's coming from their mouth. In essence, they're not given to gossip. But here's how they are to be. They're to be sober-minded. They, they, they do show self-control in their lives. And they are faithful in all things. They are very reliable and dependable. I, I, I believe that for this very fact of why he mentions their wives here and doesn't omit it, he, he is showing how he thinks through this ministry within the local church and the, the importance of women in the church, that they are very integral in the very life and ministry for the deacons. And for that matter, the elders as well. I think we also need this reminder again. In studying through this, I, this just stuck out. It may bear underscoring that just as men by their convictions and behavior can disqualify themselves for overseer, for an elder, or a deacon, in Paul's outlook, so can the women or wives of verse 11 here do great harm to the church, their marriages, and themselves if they prove not to be worthy of respect, are malicious talkers, and are not temperate and trustworthy in everything. Whatever their rights and responsibilities as Scripture sets forth, divine blessing on their endeavors depends on the, their success in finding the grace in the gospel to reflect such Christ-likeness, end quote. So when we consider why would Paul include this here, verse 11, concerning the wives of the elders, we have to think about the role. Sometimes that role in serving happens in a very private setting because of the nature of their work. Again, another writer, Marvin Vincent, wisely observes that a deacon's wife would sustain an active relationship to his office and by her ministries would increase his efficiency and by frivolity, slander, or intemperance would bring him and his office into disrepute. Repute, disrepute. Presumably, some men should not be ordained as deacons or elders. Let's get that clear because their wives are not suitable for them to serve in that office. And so that is considered. So whether you're considering, and we're considering a, a man for the role of an elder or a deacon, it kind of is a, a, a team effort, a tag team. And so I, I have sat in on, I want to say interviews, that sounds too formal where someone has been considered for this role as an elder or deacon, and they have the wives there. How do you view this role and position? So he, depending on how one views the role of women in this position can make all the difference. And again, this is, this is where I've landed, and, and not everyone agrees with that. Great men have disagreed with that. On those, I think on the third and the fourth, they were an extension of the deacons. Prefer, I mean, Phoebe, is, the term there is diakonos. It means deaconess, but again, it means servant or she was a minister, had some specific role in overseeing servant to ministry there in the church at Chancre. I mean, you have the role of women in ministry throughout Scripture, particularly in the New Testament. Think of Dorcas. Dorcas. 
there in Acts 9, who was full of good works and acts of charity. Lydia there in Philippians, who, with cl who clothed the Philippians in purple there in Acts 16. Tryphena and Tryphosa, women described as workers in the Lord there in Romans 16, verse 12, along with Phoebe, where she's identified as a servant of the church. Literally, she was, as I said, a deaconess, a minister, a servant there to some extent. So at, at some point, there were women carrying out these responsibilities in some form. But again, Paul has not seen fit to lay out all the details and what that looks like. Even if, particularly in Phoebe's case, she was never officially recognized concerning this particular office. But she was deeply involved in the ministries of the local church. And so here we have, in chapter 3, these qualifications for an elder and a deacon. And what that looks like, at least in Paul's mind, for the local church. And so what's our takeaway from this? I mean, here we do have at least a, some guidelines for those who do serve in these roles within the context of the local church. We're reminded of what God expects of them, primarily internally, as they live out their life externally, within the context of the local church and even outside in the community. We, we've got to remember here the details and how they served both as an elder or a deacon are not listed here in Scripture. So there's a lot of room for grace. Oftentimes our, our hearts and our minds and even our mouths want to respond, well, well, why do they do it that way? Or why didn't they do it that way, for that matter? And yet, whether it's this body of elders, or when we have deacons, how they serve, there's, there's this sense of trust and respect. I mean, that doesn't mean, as I said before, when we, we, we went over the qualifications for an elder, the elders don't want to hear that a deacon and a group of deacons and ministers don't want to hear feedback. That, that would be helpful and encouraging. Maybe it's just misunderstanding. But I think when, when, we, when we remember that and think about that, how it causes us to not only look at our own hearts, but also consider how we love one another, how we express those one another's within the context of the local church. Perhaps sometimes it's simply just a matter of letting them know there's a need. So there's a lot of room for grace for those serving as a deacon. But finally, consider this. You read through those qualifications there in chapter 3 for an elder or for a deacon, and we can walk away saying, well, that's only for those serving in, in that capacity. And I would argue no. I didn't mention this last week, and I was thankfully reminded that these qualifications when you summarize them, are, are part of what should be a part of every Christian's life. And, and thus we see how this can lead to those who would then serve in these various roles. Because it brings us right back to the very Christ and the gospel. It, it brings us back to all Christ has accomplished on our behalf so that those who are serving as an elder or deacon can serve faithfully and not be just so tempted to say, well, it's because of this authoritative position that I've been put in. Now, as I go over these qualifications, I'm reminded often, I remind myself often of these, that even... If I wasn't in ministry, these are qualifications that should be exemplified in my life as a believer, as a follower of Christ, and so it ought to in your life. Not perfectly. But again, I see this reminder, then how do we encourage one another to live these out together? And so this is what we need to remember. That these qualifications aren't only for 
the deacon or the elder. These are, these are characteristics of every Christian in their life. So maybe as you've heard them this morning, as you read through them, maybe there's praise, maybe there is confession, areas for growth and working out one's salvation and what that means for your life, how to encourage another brother or sister in going through these. Thank you, Lord, for my brother or sister who I know is trustworthy and I know they will not spread gossip and have not. So think of it in those terms as well. So that as we reflect on these, God is most glorified. That we are growing together as a local church for a body of believers. And all whom God brings to us. And that those who are in these positions serve well to the glory of God. For the good of the local church. And to pray for them as they serve and minister in this capacity. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, again for 1 Timothy 3. Even now, praying for those who you would direct and lead to serve as a deacon, even as an elder that you would grant the current elders great wisdom and discernment, this body great wisdom and discernment, as you see fit to grow your church here at Redeemer. And for that matter, every gospel-preaching church, to have faithful under-shepherds, overseers, elders, to gather as a body of men overseeing the local church of where they're at. For those who would serve as a deacon, as a minister, as a servant. Those whom you would direct and pursue. To see your great work accomplished in the service of our great King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That you would protect them all. And protect your church here at Redeemer for your glory, O God, and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.